Well, hello, everybody. We are back for Family Fridays. Today, I'm really excited about the topic. I think it's so needed. We are talking about nutrition and healthy and fun cooking. Um, you know, for our Duchenne families, nutrition's always an issue and something we're working with. But I think during quarantine, it probably is becoming even more important as we're in the house all day and um, we're just not as active and things like that. So today we're going to, we have some special guests who are going to help us with that, which I'm really excited. Our first one is Vanessa Yunt. She is a registered dietitian at Duke in North Carolina, and um, she works with a lot of Duchenne families as they come into her clinic. So we're really excited that she's going to share. And then a little bit after that, we are going to have the SAP family. If you remember, Amber was with us a few weeks ago. She is a co uh, coordinator for our uh, tenant, one of our Tennessee Connect groups. And I'm excited because she has her kids, Garrett and Charlotte, on, and they are going to be doing a healthy recipe for us and cooking, and it's going to be fun. So um, we're going to start with Vanessa, just with some tips and things that we can use as we're navigating cooking at home and uh, helping keeping our um, Duchenne kiddos safe during quarantine and healthy. So I'm going to turn it over now to Vanessa. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you so much to PPMD today um, for inviting me. And also to all those that are viewing today, thank you for inviting me into your home or allowing me to speak to you today in your home. This has been a, an experience for all of us. Um, I've been sure with some of the same things with meal planning. I'm, I'm a dietitian, but I can't say that I'm, I'm perfect in my eating all the time either. I'm human, just like everyone else. I do have some points um, I wanted to go over today, just points to remember when planning healthy meals. I think um, that's planning is set you up for um, being successful in healthy eating. Um, but you can have some guidelines to go by, uh, such as shopping or, you know, and considering everyone in the family, you know, what their likes and dislikes. So get everyone involved with that. Um, ask the kids, um, to write down some of their likes. Um, we're not gonna go buy everything that they like from the store, from the grocery store, but we'll definitely um, consider those, but also trying to incorporate healthy options as well. Um, also, you know, a lot of um, people now are purchasing their grocery um, online, which is a, a great way to, I think it helps you to plan a little easier because you can take recipes and you, the staffs are gonna share with you some great ideas and I have some links that also give some ideas for recipes but um, when you look at those you can easily write down or glance at those and then put in your shopping order at the same time. So I think we have some great opportunities here, some great ideas. Um, points to remember, you know, breakfast we like to say is the most important meal of the day. Um, start the day off with a protein rich breakfast. Avoid sweets and sugary foods. Um, Try to look for things that have like nine grams or less. There are some healthy cereals out there too. I know frosted um, mini wheats, they have about four or five grams of protein and about four or five grams of fiber as well. So the protein and the fiber really helps you stay full or longer instead of having those spikes in your blood sugar, which is gonna drive your hunger throughout the day. Um, yogurt is a great option too, but try to find those that are have less sugar and maybe more protein, that's a good option. And also that's an opportunity um, for that calcium and vitamin D. I know most of you, or when you go to clinic, you hear dietitians will ask you, so how many servings of calcium or vitamin D do you have a day? So getting yogurt is a good opportunity to get that. Um, bold eggs are a great um, breakfast option. They're um, lower, you know, you're not adding a lot of fat for the cooking. They're boiled. They're also good for a snack too later. And they also incorporate, um, they're a good source of vitamin D and also protein. Then we'd like to talk a little bit about um, making sure we're well hydrated. I'll have to say for myself, some days I'm really good and some days not, not so much. But um, increased water intake, amount of daily water needs to be equal to your, half of your body weight. So a person weighing, say, 60 pounds, the minimum intake should be around 30 ounces. Um, speaking of hydration, when it comes to drinks, um, water, milk, and unsweetened, 
non-dairy milk are all great choices to round out your meal, but sometimes picky eaters might struggle with the taste. Sometimes we get a little bored with just plain water. So you can add a splash of 100% juice to that, like not from concentrate. You can add that to plain seltzer water to give um, a little extra pizzazz to that to make it a little more appealing. Um, you can make your own chocolate milk. I know we like to try to keep our sugar content down, but you can make your own chocolate milk to control the amount of sugar. You can use less and less chocolate each time to help wean, if you have a selective eater at home, to try to wean that down. So those are some good opportunities for that. Um, also, if for any of those that have um, any um, swallowing difficulties, most of the time it's usually with the patients that I have my that come in. It's more sometimes the foods that are harder to chew and not necessarily the liquids. But if a fruit puree is good to add to water. So it'll thicken it, but it'll also add, good opportunity to add some fiber and some vitamins too. Um, I like to talk a little bit about sodium. So that's a good point to talk about as well when we're looking at recipes and we're shopping and, and making that shopping list. You wanna try to avoid higher sodium foods. A good rule of thumb, and this is a part of the American Heart Association too, their guidelines are 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day. I don't know about you, but if you read the labels of some things, that's that's a difficult task. Um, some ways to get around that is look for definitely fresh is best, but you can also do the canned options or frozen. Look for no salt added. Those are great options as well. If you read the nutrition label on some canned foods or prepackaged food, foods, processed foods, I know like some of the rice dinners or um, the frozen meals, one serving can have anywhere from say six, 800 milligrams of sodium. And that's, that's quite a bit. Um, so looking for those um, opportunities. The links that I provided too, um, some of those were from the American Heart Association and they have some guidelines for some good healthy um, recipes that still add flavor. You can add flavor by herbs, spices. Those are good things um, to look for. And also at the recipes, it gives you an opportunity to you know, make your list, your grocery list, so you can be successful in shopping. Um, part of eating healthy, as I mentioned, is um, being prepared. And in some ways, I feel like being at home has helped with that a little bit. Um, but I'm not always successful either. We get busy, you know, we're all um, learning at home. Some, some of my, my patients and my um, sweet kids, they already homeschool. But for those that um, don't usually, this is a kind of a new experience. So it brings about some challenges, but also you can help yourself by getting organized and be successful. So having the recipes to look at and then write down your um, shopping list. And also um, you can, buying your groceries online, which helps keep us, keeps us safe with um, our social distancing is good. So you can um, go on the app, but also you, I don't know if any of you are experiencing that, but if you may put your order in, but it may be, I think we put an order in, which is my first experience doing the online shopping. So we put it, the order in, I think it was, Monday and we can't pick it up till Saturday. So planning ahead is very important. Um, also going down our line for re remembering um, things for healthy meal planning is, you know, how, how do we prepare our meals? Um, we here in North Carolina have, since we've been home, have really been blessed with some nice weather. So it gives us the opportunity to grill outside maybe. Um, also we can bake and roll foods as well and try to use more um, lean proteins, um, chicken and po um, fish or um, poultry in general are good options. Try to limit the red meat, um, maybe to maybe once, once a week. Um, and try to include a salad or a, for lunch and dinner. Having those, um, those greens, that fiber there, the bulk, that also helps keep you fuller longer. Um, Remember to try to eat less starchy foods, replaced with less starchy vegetables. And um, there's a recipe on one of the links for um, sweet potato, baked sweet potato fries. Those are a very good option. 
um, limiting the starchy foods. You can um, use the white bean dip, which was a is a great um, snack as well. But you're going to get some fiber, so that's important. Um, eating the less starchy foods too will help minimize some of those uh, having a spike in your blood sugar, which tends to lead to hunger. So you, that's helpful. Eating foods that have more fiber and protein or, or more color, um, nutrient dense help keep you fuller longer and also helps with constipation as well. Um, also, um, with the hunger cues, we we're talking about keeping you fuller longer. I want to go back and talk a little bit about those hunger cues. I think being at home, sometimes we may get a little bored with things. So pay attention to those hunger cues. Are you really hungry? Are you starving? Um, we do that here in my house. I feel like um, myself or my children, we have already eaten. I said, there is no way possible that you could be hungry again. Um, maybe you're, you're thirsty. Um, maybe you're worried about something. So there are a lot of things that influence our hunger cues or our association with food. So just really pay attention to that, of course. Um, and stay well hydrated, which will help as well, as I mentioned. Um, on the slide, I think it's on the next one, um, you'll see that the portion sizes, I want to reinforce there are no good or bad foods. Um, sometimes it's what we eat, how much or how often. We definitely have some foods that are better choices than others, but I think not having such a negative connotation or thought about food is, is helpful. Um, when we're talking about planning healthy meals, you know, you can plan in for those trips, of course, but you need to do that. Um, I like to tell many of the patients that I work with um, you think of those healthy choice, um, the, excuse me, those snacks or those treats as um, in, a, in a little bank, like you have money. So if you're eating healthy, you can kind of fit that in. But if you've eaten a lot of snack foods throughout the day, then you've kind of lost the ability to use that treat because you've used up all your money, so to speak. I, I hope that makes sense a little bit. Um, so also I wanted to see if anything else I wanted to share with you guys. Um, we talked about the hunger cues. Um, any questions? You'll see that I've, I've provided a lot of links that are very helpful and provide some great ideas. The um, reinforce about the sodium intake for kids. And that's just not, that's not only for kids, but um, I know a, a lot of our audience may be parents of, of smaller kids or younger children, but we all need to be um, aware of and monitor our sodium intake. The heart healthy recipes, those are also from the American Heart Association. The American Heart Association is a wonderful um, resource. Um, they also will help us with um, eating less processed foods which will also contain less sugar and sodium at the same time. The 28 healthy snacks for your kids, that one was also um, very helpful. I know I have some adult learners out there as well, some adult patients, but um, those are still helpful for you. I looked at them and thought they were really good. Um, the I skipped over the seven day healthy eating plan for picky eaters. Um, those were some really good looking recipes. They also have in the, um, when you go to the link, the, um, they'll provide the recipes, but they also provide you with the nutrition um, content, which I thought, thought was helpful. Um, I think there was maybe one or a few that I thought the sodium was higher than what I would like to see, but you can always alter that by using um, like low sodium soy sauce or um, no sugar added ketchup there are ways that you can work on those um, recipes to bring them down to where you need them. But for the most part, they were all very good. They were all very um, nutrient dense foods and used very little um, processed foods. So I'll open it up to any questions that you all may have. Great. Thank you so much, Vanessa. This is really helpful. I learned a lot. What I encourage you is, um, we're going to go to the SAPS family, SAP family in just a minute. But um, 
if you have questions for Vanessa, please go ahead and put them in the comments and we will come back and ask her some of those questions. So we up next, we have Garrett and Charlotte Sapp and mom Amber, and they are going to show us um, the fun recipe they like to do. You know, I love what um, Vanessa said about just, you know, we can have everything in, in moderation. And sometimes the best thing is taking some of our favorite recipes and making them healthier. So that's one thing that the Sapp family is going to do for us with pizza. So I'm going to just turn it over to Lent, them and let us uh, let them show us what they've got. Hey guys, we're gonna make baby pizzas today. And these were um, these were sort of created by our family several years ago when my kids were really small and the, the name baby pizza stuck. And so we make these usually with, um, with whole wheat English muffins, but I think um, everybody is finding, I went to the store yesterday to get them and there were no more whole wheat English muffins. There were no more light English muffins. So we were really lucky enough to at least grab a package of the original ones. So um, we use that, we use spaghetti sauce or whatever kind of tomato sauce you like. Um, I like to use the part skin mozzarella and whatever toppings you guys like. So our family likes pepperoni, they like um, pineapples. And so I will get pineapple tidbits and drain them. And then we also use turkey pepperoni because it has um, considerably less fat than like traditional beef or pork pepperoni. So we're going to assemble some of our baby pizzas for you guys. So we always um, use Garrett's tray on his wheelchair because it, um, it just allows it to be at his height and um, putting things in dishes that have a lower profile are much easier for him to access. So he's just um, spreading his sauce on his pizzas. Maybe I can get this a little bit closer. You guys are so quiet. <laughs> no comments? <laughs> okay. Charlotte, why don't you put the cheese on? And then you just put as much or as little cheese as your family likes. And really what's nice about these is you can customize them to your tastes. And while they may not be the most healthy thing on the planet, they are certainly healthier than um, carry out pizza or delivery. And I like that you can control the portion sizes a little bit better with these. You serve them, you know, maybe two of these um, and that will be significantly less, less fat and calories than would be two traditional slices of pizza. Okay, so these are turkey pepperonis. And pineapples. But again, use whatever you want. This may be a good way to start to sneak in some veggies on your kids. Maybe you put a couple of spinach leaves or um, peppers or onions or whatever you guys like. And that's pretty much it. So we've got some that we pre-made to show everyone in the oven. This is what we have. These are our baby pizzas. Oh, those look amazing. Aren't they fun? And so we just bake them for eight or 10 minutes until the cheese is melted and they're a little bit crispy and they keep pretty well in the fridge. Um, so we might make a big package of them and eat half of them one day, stick them in the fridge and then bake them up again, you know, for five or six minutes to get them crispy. So that's it. That's all we got, right? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. That I'm hungry now, but um, <laughs> that's great. I think that um, it's just a great recipe and things that you can alter based on what your kids like. And so um, don't forget to go on and you can see on that we have the recipe for you uh, on the link. So now we have some uh, questions that have been coming and definitely keep sending those if you have them. Uh, this question is for Vanessa. 
Uh, someone asked, how do you measure when you're cooking at home? How do you measure the sodium when you're just making your own recipes? How do you know how much is kind of more than you should be putting in a recipe? So that's, could... that, okay, that's a good question. Um, I start with considering how much sodium is in the ingredient that you're using. And you can kind of keep track of that. You know how much that you're using in the recipe and you probably write that down, refer back to the nutrition facts of um, the ingredient to look at it that way. Okay. But, you know, if you're making, if you're doubling a batch, then you would double that amount, but you would just consider all of those. And once you do it one time, then you'll know, time forward. And Rachel, we use my fitness pal at our house and I'll create recipes within my fitness pal and you can, it'll show how much sodium is in everything. Um, we use it to count macros at our house and just to see kind of where our carbs and proteins fall. Um, but I think that's another good way. It's super easy to, to look at sodium that way, just to scan your barcodes um, and it automatically adds your, all those nutrients and um, sort of stuff. So. That's a good point, Amber. Um, the American Heart Association also had a sodium tracker. So, but the MyFitnessPal is very easy to use. There's yeah. an app, app seemingly for everything. Yeah, MyFitnessPal, I know I've used it before as well, and you can go on and get the free app for that. And I think you can upgrade if you want, but that's a great idea to be able to track even, I, I think, not that we're eating out very much right now, but sometimes when you're eating out to track the sodium in a day and, and especially as kids get older, I know we've put that on my son's phone um, as a teenager to kind of help him track at times. So that's an option as well. Okay, great. Well, another question I wanted to um, ask and um, I'll start with Amber if they have this experience at their house and if they don't, then that's okay. Then maybe Vanessa, uh, Vanessa also chime in, but uh, do you have experience with the hang grease and what are some good snacks if you um, if your child is kind of getting the hang grease? I know that I hear that often with Duchenne families. Uh, so what what's something you combat that in your house, Amber, if that's an issue? <laughs> yeah, um, here look, we get on kicks at our house where they like certain snacks. Um, this week it is ants on a log. And so they take um, celery and they'll put peanut butter on it, and we have it. We're out of raisins, but I happen to have some of the the low sugar craisins, and so they put the the cranberries in the peanut butter. And I don't know who named it ants on a log, but that's what we call it here. And so you know, it's not a lot of carbohydrates, but it's a you know, it's a lot of protein. So that's the current trend. <laughs> um, popcorn is a good snack as well if you find the ones you can do the popping pop popcorn at home yourself. Um, be careful with adding a lot of extra butter or, or salt, but popcorn's a very good snack because it is, um, you can make it healthy, but it's a good source of fiber as well. And a little bit of that goes a long way. I mean, you can really get, get a good snack with that. Um, nuts are a good snack as well. They um, have lots of vitamins and nutrients, but they have healthy fats and protein. And as Amber mentioned about the ants on the log, it's a low carbohydrate snack. So those are great options. And you can make your own trail mix um, with the nuts. You can add like multigrain Cheerios to that. You could even um, maybe put some dark chocolate. I'm even gonna put a little treat in there, put some dark chocolate, little morsels in there. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. I, th I know I find just in our house when we have protein every, you know, few hours, some sort of protein that helps us with the hangry um, a little bit. So uh, for Vanessa, we've had a question about snack ideas for those who have trouble swallowing. Can you give us some good ideas for that? Absolutely. Yogurt's a great option. Um, you can make smoothies. Um, one of the links that I shared there was a great um, berry smoothie. And I think that was one of the uh, American Heart Association recipes. Um, making, making your own um, puddings, those are good options to use. Okay, great. And I know for us, um, we used uh, 
protein in the protein powder in this smoothie just as a really great breakfast on the go not that we're on the go anymore but before yeah. that. <laughs> but it's a good way to hide some nutrients in there too you can put kale spinach um, carrots um my son is a selective eater so that's a good opportunity for me to get those healthy options in there. And you're absolutely right, Rachel, about adding the protein powder. He's not a big protein um, eater. He's not, not crazy about meat. So I worry about him, you know, not getting in enough protein. So we add, um, then a protein is one that I use. It's um, easy to find. Great. Uh, I'd love to hear from... Amber, you know, I think that we, we, it's kind of what Vanessa talked about too, about uh, balancing healthy eating, but also not limiting every single thing. And just kind of how, what's your advice, Amber, in terms of not making it a struggle and being, a, especially if you have a picky eater, you know, how do we balance um, them, you know, eating well, that's kind of the, the hard part about Duchenne is they've got, they have to eat, eat well, right? But um, how do you balance that in your house? The, if you have a picky eater, if you have somebody kind of that's just a struggle with eating, what, what's your advice for that? Well, thankfully, I don't have really picky eaters. Um, but I think if it's something new, everybody tries it for us. Um, and at least try one bite of it. And for a while, um, when they were younger, to get them to, to try new foods, we would go to the grocery and I would let them choose the vegetable of the week. You know, like it was something really, really fun and exciting. And so we tried a lot of new vegetables that way for a while. Um, and they were more apt to taste them because they had picked it and it was kind of, it was their turn for vegetable of the week. Um, and so I think that that helped maybe to change their taste, change their palates a little bit. Um, now they pretty much eat, they pretty much eat whatever I serve. They may not love it, but they eat it. Um, and so on the weekends, we have what we call a cheat day. So we're going to eat really good all week long. We're going to stick really close to kind of our, our healthy eating plan. And then um, here, he likes to plan what is, what's cheat day going to look like? You know, he, he works up towards that all week long. So maybe instead of the times where you're tempted to have something you probably shouldn't, you know, we are reminded that, oh, cheat day is Friday night and we're going to order pizza together or we're going to go out to dinner or whatever. So I think having something to look forward to and build up to um, is good for us to stay on track. That's good. I yeah. like that. And I do too. That's an excellent strategy to use. Um, and with people, persons who also are managing their weight in general, that's a great um, strategy to use as well. I think you're more successful when you are mindful such as that. You, you know, well, I can do this if I plan for it. And I think it helps keep you more successful. That's great. And, and just, you know, I love the part about uh, letting them have a little bit of control and choice over um, their healthy food. That kind of gives them a sense of control and the and being part of the planning process. And um, I've heard from um, a mom who has a much older child now, but um, that she said part of what she would do is what a chore was for the child to compile the grocery list for the family. And I thought that's a great chore. You know, sometimes I struggle to find chores that my Duchenne um, child can do, but that's a great chore to just do the grocery list for the family and get input from everyone and things like that. And then that also gives them a little bit of control in the situation. So I have another question um, for you, Vanessa. You, know, you were talking about fluid intake and I know seltzer waters and sparkling waters are really popular right now. Can you kind of tell us when we're calculating fluid intake, what, what, fluids should we count? What counts as water or uh, as healthy fluid? You know, does milk count? I mean, when you're counting the yeah. elements, what counts? Milk does count. Um, uh, rule of thumb, too, is anything at room temperature is a liquid, um, even if you did like a low sugar, a sugar-free jello. You could, you could use that. That's a liquid. Um, that's also something that's helpful for those who have swallowing difficulty is to use Jello. Um, we do have um, counting those like ice cream as well. 
I mean, I'm not encouraging listlessly eat our, you know, eat ice cream for our fluid, but you can count that. Um, like I said, anything at room temperature is um, considered a liquid. When we are monitoring fluid status in um, different populations, we have to consider if they had that, that was part of their fluid. So I hope that helps answer that a little bit. Um, definitely, we like to encourage um, water definitely is a great choice, but we all get a little bored with that. But um, you can do like green tea. You can count that. Um, and adding the purees, you can do um, like the, the smoothies that would count as well. Okay, great. That's really helpful. That's a helpful thing. Um, so another question is, how do, is there a certain time we should shut the kitchen down every night or, you, you know, do you have any advice for, I know that, uh, you know, intermittent fasting and all those things are popular right now, but in terms of for our kids, is, is it a good idea to um, have a certain time that they stop eating in the evening or do you just have any thoughts on that? Yes, um, I think that is a good idea. It helps with the overall planning. It helps um, with structure and scheduling, which I think is very important. Um, establishing with children with different ages, their bedtimes are different. So you want to be mindful of that. And definitely maybe no eating at one to two hours prior to bedtime, at least um, no at the one hour mark. Because we could, you know, eating right just before bed could cause some GI upset. You could have some um, indigestion, what have you. It's just not as healthy for you. And also, you know, with your metabolism. Um, you could have some milk, of course, or some yogurt. It's a good snack, bedtime snack. Okay. And it, um, that protein in that would also help with the overall um, hunger and carrying you over to the next day. Hey, that's great. You know, a tip just give you from my own house that we do just to help with limiting eating is um, we have a rule that you only eat in the kitchen, of course, for movie night oh. or something that might be different, but that limiting to the kitchen helps us uh, keep down on constant snacking and things like that. So we found that to be a really helpful way to um, limit eating, eating times and eating amounts. Yes, that is very good. Yeah, yeah that, that, um, so I encourage that. Well, thank you all. I, um, I think we're at the end of our questions, which is great. This has been really helpful just to continue to think about, I think in the Duchenne population, we have to remember that nutrition is part of our toolbox, our medicine toolbox, and the way that we can um, help our kids be healthy with heart health and GI health and things like that. So I just encourage you that to remember that food is part of the toolbox as we treat Duchenne and help keep um, our Duchenne, the Duchenne boys and girls that we love to help keep them healthy. And thank you so much to Amber and Charlotte and Garrett and Vanessa for sharing with us their tips and their yummy pizza. I wish we could eat it. Um, so this has been a great, great topic. And I know that if you will go on our website, we have some of those links that Vanessa talked about. Also, as we finish up, I wanted to talk about Duchenne Daily today at three o'clock Eastern. Tune in to Facebook, tune in back here again, and we are going to wrap up our Duchenne Daily 20. I think we've got a fun, special surprise, so I uh, invite you to come back at 3 o'clock Easter time, Eastern time for us to celebrate our Duchenne Daily 20 together. Thank you for joining us today on uh, Family Fridays, and we will see you again next time. Bye-bye.